Welcome to the Walk Talk Cafe, everyone. This is our first session for uh, 2024, and this is a place where we chat live about teaching a trade in today's society. And just a word before we start, anything that we share with you is available on the Apricot Vocational Training website. Uh, the collaborative documents and resources, so this presentation, the, the collaborative document that, that we're going to work inside, the library of resources, it's all available on the website. So each session has its own article and you can find the recording and the summary in the archive. And then once again, there's also the calendar. Make sure you sign up for the calendar. You can sync it to your work calendar and then you can get notifications each, each time there's a VokTalk Cafe and you can know what the, the subject is going to be for each VokTalk Cafe. So that's all housed on the website. Remember, this is a pilot project. So your implications and suggestions are really important to us to help us create a space for you. Everything you have to say is worth saying. And today we are talking with the healthcare sector and we want to explore simulations as a learning tool. And we want to explore the impact of these, of this, of, of using simulations in learning situations. Today's goals, we would like to identify some key concepts in simulation as a learning tool. We want to explore a little bit the learning theory behind the structure and why, what makes, trying to identify, well, what makes it effective? And we want to situate it in both education context and in a workforce context. So we can see that there's a continuity there. The session, the way this is broken down. So we have the presentation and the technology and teaching inspiration capsule and those parts are recorded we're going to do this 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 little 10 minute pre 10 to 15 minute presentation right now we stop the recording we then move over to the interactive element which is the participatory discussion where we talk about what the presentation and some of the topics it brings up and then we're going to go back to the recorded mode and we're going to record the technology and teaching inspiration capsule all right, so let's talk about simulation. So what is simulation training? So simulation training is where you're representing sort of these complex real world situations with enough fidel fidelity to what it looks like in the real world, but you're doing it in a controlled context. And the goal of this is to, to, to focus on learning and not just reaction, but learning. And you're doing this in this sort of social constructivist way. You're immersing the person in a situation, you're encouraging reflection, you're encouraging feedback, and, and you're doing it in a way that's a safe space because it's, it is highly focused on the learning, but also the learner knows that the goal of this activity is the learning and not necessarily the actual result of that if that had been a real life experience. So it makes it a safer space to be able to experiment and learn um, since the goal focuses on the learner and not on, in this case, the patient or, or the ultimate goal. It's important to outline that, that simulation trading is a technique, not a technology. Although that there, because today with the digitization of our, of our society, there's a lot of new stuff coming out that involves digital tools simulation can easily be two people in a room. It doesn't necessarily involve digitization. It is a, definitely a student-centered technique because, or student or learner-centered technique because it's the learner is the core of the, of this, of the situation. Um, it engages in empathy because it is a lived experience. The person is doing more than in just engaging their brain and their intellect. They're engaging their hands and their feet and they're smelling an environment and they're feeling, uh, they're feeling um, other entities in the environment moving around. And it's this, this sort of holistic approach. It's this lived experience of them actually having to do the movements, right? It's always sort of that analogy of like, you can learn to ballroom dance on your own with a computer, but it makes a whole lot <laughs> it makes a whole lot more sense when you're ballroom dancing in a room with other people. And simulation training is very effective because it, it situates that learner in that analyze, evaluate, create realm of Bloom's taxonomy, and it which encourages higher order thinking and 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 critical thinking. 
once again, the focus is not on the on the actual goal of the activity. The focus is on the learner, so that that those higher order cognitive levels are heavily solicited. There are different types of simulations, and when you read through the literature, like, okay, I'm using the words that I found in the literature, but even then, I was kind of like, well why do we differentiate electronic patients and computer patients? And I didn't find answers to that, okay? So really this is like the limitations of what I was able to read in the studies. But the types of simulations so far that I've found is we have the difference between types of patients. So this is where the focus on the simulation is putting the learner in relationship to a patient, okay? So you have electronic patients, computer patients, and standardized patients. So standardized patients is that idea of like you have like a fish technique and then there's all the description of the person or there's a video recording of somebody that describes themselves, who they are, and that the, the learner can glean a lot of information off that patient and that patient can be plugged in and out of different situations. So that if the goal of the learning is how to administer medication or the goal of the learning is how to move a patient or the goal of the learning is something else, you have this, this, this patient that can be plugged in and out of, of, of situations. And this is a really interesting one because it allows the, the learner to develop empathy and a connection to this fake real individual. <laughs> this patient so as the as the patient follows them throughout a learning journey like there's a relationship that develops right computer and electronic patients these are your simulator type patients and these are either just the electronic uh, like a uh, the mannequin itself which is could be could be that has movement because that there's you can plug it in and there's gears and stuff and whatnot and then there's the idea of a computer patient which is where you have ai and, and machine learning type uh, software packages that are doing stuff with that patient based on the way the learner is interacting with that patient. It's the reactive. There's also part task trainers. So if you want the learning to focus on really sort of the, the essential skills or the beginning skills, then you might be looking at a uh, part task trainer. So you might be just sort of looking at like an arm and that arm could be electronic or computerized, it doesn't negate that that doesn't exist. But like at this point, we don't need to worry about the full patient. We're, we're really just focusing on developing a skill set. So we might use partial trainers. Verbal trainers is where uh, you're going after um, uh, interactions, um, communication skills, uh, exposing bias, trying to develop those, those soft skills. Um, and in situ training is, this is a newer field. And this is holding, it's happened, it seems from the literature, what I was reading, it happens more in the workforce. But instead of having a separate simulation room, these are situations that are happening in your place of work, where an afternoon or a morning or a time period will be designated as you're going to be doing training at this. And sometimes it is known what the training will be, and sometimes it's surprised knowing that like in the example of an emergency room, you know that you're gonna be having training on, I don't know, mass casualties. And so you know that this is coming, but you don't know exactly how the patients are gonna arrive. You don't know. And so you know it's a simulation, but it's to try and get as close to what you will experience in your true work, work environment. Those are in situ types of uh, simulations. So why is simulation an effective learning tool? Well, from the literature, it really does improve both individual and group or team performance, depending on how it's administered. And it's really going after problem solving skills, self-reliance and overall knowledge. The reason why it's effective is because it's the way it's scaffolded. And we're gonna look a little bit at the pedagogical tools behind it, the pedagogical framework behind it is it's linking previous knowledge to new knowledge and it's scaffolding this. It's in a low stakes environment. So the learner knows, although the goal is ultimate patient, is improve patient care, the learner knows that the focus at this point is the learning process. And it offers this idea of repetition. I can keep practicing to improve on. So there is a type of pedagogy associated with this, I learned <laughs> through the literature called simulation pedagogy. 
And it's based on uh, Dr. Culp's experiential learning, where you turn an experience, a lived experience, into targeted learning goals that are measurable and articulative. And it goes through this, this cyclic process of active experimentation, concrete experiments, reflection, and conceptualization from both the facilitator point of view and the learner point of view. So for example, if you're looking at concrete experience, which is the actual simulation that you're living, well, the learner is engaging in that experience and the, 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 the facilitator has is either facilitating that, so making sure that the, the learning is happening in that environment, but is, is also participating in the design of that experience to ensure an authentic experience and a targeted experience for the learning goal. So the types of, the, 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 the frameworks behind this are the first and foremost constructivism, where the educator is considered a facilitator not the distributor of knowledge. So it's really going against that sage on the stage. The, the, the facilitator is not going to stand up there, talk about it, and then have the, have the learner do it. The facilitator is going to let the learner experience it and experience the discomfort of, I'm in the process of learning. This is an uncomfortable process, but I know it's a process and I will get to become comfortable with the material afterwards. It's also, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of theory behind cognitive load because in a simulated environment, there's a lot of stimulus, right? This is not, you're not in a situation where you're controlling, uh, you can control all the uh, stimulus because like if you're using a textbook, the only stimulus you have is the words on a page, right? Or I guess you could say the heat in the room, you could there, like there are other factors there, but really the stimulus is the words on the page. But in a simulated environment, there can be there can be a lot of stimulus overload. And because um, humans are sensitive to that and have limited working memory, the educator, the facilitator has to consider the learning goals, the learner expectations of the, of the situation and of the, the, of the learning goals and the amount of new knowledge. And so it really has to situate what is the learning goal today? So we'll see later on sort of those key points. And, and, and what came up in the Beck's practices is focusing on like what has to be very clear to both the facilitator and the learner is what's the learning goal of this activity. It's not let's do this activity and let's see what we learn. These are very targeted goals. So you know ahead of time what the goal is. And that's to try and cut down on the, on the over stimulus overload. And then, of course, this is all rooted in sociocognitive learning theory, where we as humans, it's a social experience. And this, the educator is creating these social situations of learning, even if it's just the educator and the, and the learner, or the facilitator, and you're still learning from each other and you're learning from this situation because you're interacting in a social environment. Okay. So then one of the sites that I found, um, and the links for the resources are at the end of the presentation, and we'll put it, we'll put it in the resource, uh, the library of resources, was from, I can't remember the acronym, International Nursing Association Simulation and Learning, something like that. And this, you know this, Catherine? I'm on, I'm on the right track? Right on, something like that, okay. And this is an international body that does a lot of and supports a lot of research into simulation training. And they came up with and they revised these standards on a regular basis on uh, like best practices to be thinking about when you're creating simulate when you're creating simulations. Uh, creating, deploying, using, interacting with simulations. And it goes from recognizing the importance of simulations as professional development, right? How we are in a workforce and that workforce, it's not like the knowledge I came in with when I started is the same knowledge that I need when I leave. Like this is a continuous process. The importance of briefing. So, and there's a lot of articles on this, and these articles are really interesting because I found a bunch of, I can so you see some of these older, art, older articles. Okay, let's see stuff from around the 2010s focuses a lot on debriefing and sort of the best practices around debriefing. But then I noticed there's a lot of newer articles, like let's say 10 years later, that's talking about the importance of pre-briefing, which goes to what we were talking, what I 
mentioned before about the the idea of 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 um constructivism where you really have to situate the learning and the pre-briefing is setting up the learning goals so that the learner knows what the focus is. Obviously then there's simulation design and facilitation, then there's outcomes and objectives, and then you get into the digital enhance. So uh, uh, using digital simulators, using artificial intelligence, machine learning, all this kind of stuff to get into different types of learning and to render this a little bit more accessible. So one of the examples I came across that I thought I'd just bring up because it's it's not really the digital AI side of learning or or it's not very high tech, but in one of the studies they presented a video series. And this what's interesting about this is this was in conjunction with a home care clinical rotation. Now, a lot of these studies have to deal with nursing. The ones I was looking at were really had to deal with nursing. And I realized that in, in the the in our situations, we're not necessarily, we're not teaching nurses, right? We have uh, nursing assistants, we have home care, we have the STCs, right? That are even, <laughs> so I, I realize this, but we do have stages and I thought, okay, well, this is kind of interesting. And so in this study, what they what they said was they had it was it was an experimental study. So they had a control group and a and 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 a, a, a group that that was had the treatment. And they created a series of four videos where uh, they had targeted learning inside those videos. So they wanted one of the videos was to have uh, to raise cultural awareness. Another video was to raise awareness about dementia. Another, so they had, and each one of them had, had targeted goals and the goals are in the study. Um, and before the, the students went out on their home care visits, they had to watch the video. So they had some pre-work to do before the video. They had a pre-briefing. They watched the video in groups and then they then they came up with solutions in teams of two, and then they debriefed as a group before they went out onto their rotation. And the feedback that came back from the students at the end of the program, and these are students that were sort of at the end of their, their, their nursing program, was that those videos helped them understand not just content, so not just the subject matter, but the way in which healthcare workers, especially ones dealing with home care, should operate as a team, setting themselves out, going out to do the work that they need to work in the in, in the home environment, and coming back and rendering that information accessible to other members of their team. So that I thought was really kind of interesting because that's an example where it's simulation being integrated into a live situation but it's being scaffolded from just like we saw with the with the the standards there saying okay make sure, like design it it has to be designed properly the goals have to be clear etc et but that the students really appreciated it um and in that study it's hard to say did it affect their learning because it was all self uh, self-reported and I, from the study, nobody failed the class. So you're assuming, okay, well, it's hard to say if they would have failed if they hadn't have done it, but the students had a definite appreciation of that activity. Okay, so our key takeaways here um, that we can maybe set ourselves up with to be a chat a bit would be that simulation learning is a learner-centered pedagogical approach or learning approach that's used both in education and in the workforce. Digitization will make it more common. So the example of the video means it's going to become more and more common throughout both education and the worker's career. But there are key elements in simulation design. We have to make sure that the learning goals are clear, that the design is appropriate, and those pre and post briefings are incredibly important, not just for the simulation, but to situate it in the context of the trade. That's a tough conversation to interrupt. I, I'm, uh, oh, darn, that was so interesting. Um, simulation, it's been mentioned in the conversation already that simulation does not require high tech. Uh, it needs to be rooted in a sound and solid uh, learning uh, objective. And that's that, that's super important. In this segment of the Vogue Talk Cafe, I always bring up a little bit of, of a 
technology tool idea or uh, uh, to that hopefully you guys can use in your in your lessons. I'm not going to go to uh, virtual reality. I'm not going to go to uh, simulation in real life, but propose uh, setting up branching scenarios using forms. Uh, go, uh, those of you at Lester B are going to be using Google Forms. In most of the other school boards, it's going to be uh, Microsoft Forms. But um, the idea is to build a scenario that continues in different ways with positive or negative consequences depend, depending on the answers that are uh, provided by the learner. And the, the information can be put in text in the form, but you can also put audio recordings with sound effects or without sound effects, or of course, video recordings as well. And the, the uh, situations where it could be useful is when you want the students to analyze the information on a patient's file and you provide them with a file, you need, you need, you need to make decisions or decide, decide how to complete a procedure uh, on the choices made. I thought maybe first aid would be a good uh, context to review the procedure as well. Uh, how to do it? Again, in this case, you need a clear, precise idea. So you need to plan in advance what the branching options are going to be, what the questions are going to be. Personally, when I do this kind of stuff, I like to do it on a big piece of paper and do it by hand but and do a mind map. But there are many ways. But clarify the intention, enter the information in separate questions, and then you determine the branching option for each of the answer. If the student's answer is uh, yes, no, or maybe, then they're directed to another step in the process. You can create loops or or put them in a straight line. The answer, the answers can be complicated, like this is not a correct answer, go back and try again, or you can branch it to like a little bit like the books that you were, uh, think of the books that were popular about 20 years ago, like the Les Livres dont vous êtes le héros, it must have been uh, the old, <laughs> 20 well. years ago. You're yeah. funny, Mark. <laughs> Try 50 years ago. <laughs> you was choose it? your own adventure books. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't it 20 oh, years ago? Man, it was like when I was a kid. <laughs> so, okay, 30 years ago then? Anyway, a long time ago. ago. <laughs> the idea of creating a path that students explore by themselves is, is what I want to propose. So uh, my mandate is to provide support about the integration in technology and teaching and learning. Don't hesitate to contact me or my colleague, James Byrne, who's there on screen as well. You have the address of our uh, website on screen. And from there, you can contact us. You can subscribe to our monthly newsletter, Bite Size News. We're there. So invite Catherine, Sylvia, invitation accepted. Just let's book a time and let's do that visit. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Very good. Right. Thank you. Before we before we close up, are there any? This is the open mic part. This is any questions you have that aren't necessarily related to the topic that we might have. Like, okay, Mark, can I book a time with you or whatever? Uh, do you guys have any questions before we move on? I have a statement. Statement. I, I felt that we dominated the talk <laughs> <laughs> because I warned you that once you started with simulation, uh, Sylvia and I will not stop. It is something Catherine, that it, it keeps us going. It really does. A passion. It, it is. It's a passion. And what with the response we see from the students is mm -hmm. phenomenal. It really is. So Don't worry about dominating the conversation. You <laughs> it's me that dominates the conversation. So no biggie. And, and I kind of prefer people want to be able to interact. And... With, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. No, we, we're very appreciative of uh, remember, this is Vokta Cafe. This is experiential. This is experiential learning. <laughs> right learning. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, to continue well, this discussion, you. go ahead, go to vt.proceed.ca, log in, join the trade group, either keep this discussion going. You can add, because I will post the information from this session into it. You can just add your comments there start a new discussion thread uh you need a hand just use the chat button that's what Catherine always uses our little chirp button there uh after that so if you would fill out our feedback form that would, that would be greatly appreciated once again if you have an idea for a voc talk cafe go ahead and and let us know about it uh in the form we'll contact you uh you can always contact one of us and oh yeah so this presentation is going to be in our in our resource document. There are so many <laughs> research studies that uh -huh. are like 
and I didn't even list all of them, man. I went down a massive rabbit hole, but it was like super interesting. So because you, Catherine and Sylvia and Ellen's there too. Hi, Ellen. Um, <laughs> you have a lot of experience. Oh, like, Ellen's there. <laughs> yeah, Ellen's came in. Um, like you might find these, like you might already be aware of some of these studies, but um, uh, I really found them like very useful because I was reading a lot and there was like tons of stuff that we didn't even touch upon, right? Like exactly attitudes of facilitators, like all kinds of stuff. Like it was, they were super, super interesting. So you have access to this. Um, there are a couple of these studies I'm going to tell you, like some of them were behind a, pay, a journal paywall. And that was it. Sounds good. Next, our next Vokta Cafe next Monday, January 29th. And we have our digital open sandbox where we get to play with some tech tools. Nice. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Thank you for coming. Much appreciated. Hey. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.